self-reliant fare, where it's this self-reliant health. That's what we're going to talk about. Um, and you know, the reason we picked that is because of this fair, it's like, what if, what if nothing happens? I mean, just think, if there's a disaster, you think they're going to do minor things in a hospital? No, they're going to be taking care of major things. Yeah. What? Closer? Okay. So, what I thought I'd start with is um, knowing some basic principles so that you can guide your health care no matter what's available. And it's so nice to be able to just be out there in the middle of nowhere and be able to take care of problems. I mean, you could drop me off blindfolded in an area and we could find something to heal something, you know, because they're always there, always in, in, the, in the environment. So the first principle in the School of Natural Healing is the whole is greater than the part. Now that sounds logical, but is, isn't it just the opposite of what everybody's doing today? Isn't that what drugs are all about? They're saying the part is greater than the whole. Isn't that what foods are all about? They're giving the part, not the whole. And so, if you eat whole foods, you're going to get whole health. If you eat parts of foods, you're only going to have parts of health. And you're going to be deficient in certain things and uh, your health's going to deteriorate. And you know, you can have all the food storage you want. If you're too sick to eat it, it's not going to do you much good. So it's good to know the basics. And uh, also, I love herbology because you're not dependent on anybody. If you don't like the prices of an herb company, you go out and pick it yourself. It's not rocket science, <laughs> okay? So uh, yeah, the whole is greater than the part. And uh, that goes for vitamins. Vitamin supplements is the part. The food is the whole. Drugs are the part. Herbs are the whole. Twinkies are the part. Whole grain cereal is the whole, okay? So the whole is greater than the part, and you are going to have a healthier you by doing that. Also, um, be wary of something called standardized herbs. You can't potentize herbs unless you're going to drug them. So the only way to make something stronger than what it is, other than concentrating, is to take an item out and put it back in. For example, we had a wonderful, wonderful product. Now we still do. It's now called Sinus Plus. But uh, it's been on the market for a long time. And we never had one complaint about this product. People loved it, it worked very well. And then the company that had been manufacturing for us back then, that's not the same company now, it's, these guys are really good now. But uh, that company decided they were going to potentize our formula. I mean, it already worked, I didn't understand that. So what they did, just like you can take cocaine out of coca leaves, they took ephedrine out of ephedra, and then they put it back into our product, and almost immediately, we started getting complaints about the product. Here the product had been on the market for 20, 30 years, and we didn't start getting complaints about it until they put a drug back into it. And so yes, a drug may make it work faster, but the whole thing with drugs is when you isolate what you think is the active ingredient, then all of the buffers that are naturally in there, the things that make the herb safe, are gone. So you may get effect faster and stronger but then your window of side effects is going to open up. And so you'd, you'd start getting side effects like death when you isolate chemicals. Okay? So the whole is greater than the part. Now, there's two forms of medicine, and they came about back in Hippocrates' time. Okay, and Hippocrates, the father of medicine, he was a keen observer of nature, and he was able to observe that the body has an inherent ability to move towards wellness. No matter what the circumstance, the body will move towards wellness. And he said, we as natural practitioners, all we have to do is see what the body's doing 
and help it in its course towards wellness. Now, Democritus said, oh, come on, Hippocrates. That's just like religion. You can't see it, you can't prove it, so therefore it doesn't exist. He says what exists is matter. We're all made up of simple matter, and all you have to do is act on it with other matter to change its course. And so two forms of medicine split at Democritus' time, and there really is no in-between. Either the body moves towards wellness or it does not. And so we look at that and go, all right, that's going to guide our principle. So that principle is very important in dealing with things so you'll know what's working. Probably the best example of that is a fever. Also, Hippocrates said, first do no harm. So if your substances are doing people harm, then you shouldn't use them. And then um, cleansing and nourishing. We'll talk about that in a minute. I'm going to get some of my uh, material from the herb syllabus. Now, the School of Natural Healing uh, has had their books available to their students for quite a long time. And we've had the School of Natural Healing available to anybody, the book. This herb syllabus is something new. It's been available to students for quite a while, but we just published it. It's only been out a short time. And so I'm going to take some of my material from here. There's the School of Natural Healing and the uh, herb syllabus. The, um, in the, in the uh, syllabus on page, what is it, 727, we have yarrow. And yarrow uh, is the herb that we use for fevers. So you look at a fever and uh, you, what's happening? Person gets hot, their temperature rises. Okay, now if you look at Hippocrates, you'll look at that and go, Oh, that's what the body wants to do? Well, let's work with it. But if you're afraid of what the body does, if you're not sure of what's going on here, then you're going to look at that and go, oh, the body's malfunctioning. I think I'd better give it something to stop the fever. Isn't that what just about everybody does? Ooh, the temperature goes up. You call your doctor. Oh, I got a fever. What temperature is it? Oh, it's 102. Oh, well, you better take an aspirin or Tylenol. Oh, it's 104. Oh, you better take an aspirin or Tylenol. Why do they ask? It's always the same answer. You take something to stop the fever because they think that fever is the disease. That's the problem. It's not a disease. That fever is the way the body deals with the invader. And so when the temperature of your body goes up, your immune system kicks in. So if you take a drug to stop a fever, what are you doing? You're stopping your immune system from working, and the invader has free reign inside. Okay? So as natural practitioners, we look at that and we go, okay, the body wants to be hot, we'll make it hot, and we put them in a tub of hot water. Now that's two extremes. You shut off a fever, or you build a fever. You see any problem with uh, that second one? Maybe burn out your brain cells. Haven't you heard that if your temperature goes up too high, you'll burn your brain cells out? Dr. Mendelssohn, in his book, How to Raise a Healthy Child, in spite of your doctor, he was a pediatrician from the Chicago area, he states that the body won't go over 106 degrees, no matter what, due to a viral or bacterial infection. That's just about where the body stops. You know, 107 would be, boom, that's the top. So you get 106, that's going to be, that could be something normal. And some of your worst diseases, some of your more dangerous ones, have low temperature, maybe 100 or 101, maybe 99. So it's really not the, the temperature, it's just how you deal with it. And so um, as far as the danger of burning out your brain, brain cells, this is really not going to happen unless you don't uh, observe. Now, when you get really hot and you have a fever, what else do you get? Thirsty, chills, yeah, that, that helps put them in a tub of water for that. You get thirsty, and so that's part of the therapy. If you're thirsty, then we give the body what it needs. In fact, we give it more than what it needs. Because we know that the body cools off, it maintains its temperature, it, it increases, it decreases via perspiration. Now, if you took all of your perspiration cells that's in your body, they're all folded in, and you stretched out your skin so that all that surface was available, 
you'd have a surface the size of a football field. That's how efficient your body is in using its space. And so that large space will then be able to control the temperature no matter what via the liquid you're putting in. So if you keep yourself well hydrated, then you don't have to worry about any damage from a fever. Anybody ever been in a walk-in refrigerator? Okay. Yeah, you know, it's just a refrigerator. You can go in and work and things. And you can work in there for a while. Let's just say it's 32 degrees. <clears throat> you can work in there for quite a while, couldn't you? Now, let's, let's take a pool of water that's 32 degrees. Okay. How long do you think you can stay in there? You're not very long because the transfer of temperature is immediate in water. That's why we use water as a medium in dealing with fever. So your body will at any time be able to be exactly what it is. Perspiration is going to go out into the water and the body will carry the heat off that way. So you don't have to worry about the temperature of fever. Okay, what, what else might you worry about with a fever? Passing out, you know? Yeah, a seizure. A lot of times seizures are something with fevers. Let me tell you, a seizure only happens on the upswing of a, of a temperature. So it's the temperature change. It's your body's way of adjusting to a temperature. If I was to pass out here on the stage, please don't call the paramedics. I don't need a drug for anti-convulsive you know, medication. I don't need it. Because it was my body's way of dealing with the problem. Is fainting a disease? No, you faint so that your body can be this way so blood can go to your head. It's as simple as that. You don't need anti-convulsives because your body's working. Your body's doing what it needs to do. It was really interesting. We, uh, we were at a, a company Christmas party, and uh, one, of the, one of the couples there, their little child, uh, threw up. Yeah, not the best thing in a dinner, but uh, after the child threw up, we cleaned it up, um, they bundled the child up and ran off. And so I, I kind of intercepted him. I said, where are you going? And they said, the baby threw up. We're going to the hospital. I'm going, well, you see, the baby had a problem. It couldn't digest his food, so it threw it up. So that was the remedy. Already been taken care of. You don't have to worry about it anymore. The remedy was throwing up. They still went to the hospital. I can't remember how much they spent, you know. They didn't find anything because the remedy was already there. Your body's not malfunctioning when it regurgitates. And it gets rid of something. In fact, it's really interesting in natural healing. If you give drugs to stop a problem, you have to realize that maybe that problem that you think, think is there isn't the problem at all. For example, when you come in contact with a virus, how's it going to get into your body? Probably up your nose or in your ear or through your eyes or you know, some orifice. It's going to get in that way. Okay? So what do you think the body does when it contacts a virus? What do you think the body does? It lets the nose run to eliminate the viruses. It flushes them out. So when somebody has clear fluid coming out of their nose, that's when they're most contagious because it's a live virus that's being flushed out of your system. That's how the body deals with it. If you take some drug to stop you from sniffling, if you stop the, the fluid from coming out, basically you're saying, okay, let's just leave this in here and let it take hold. You're thwarting the body's way of working, you see? All we have to do as natural practitioners is look at what the body's doing and help it in its course towards wellness. If your eyes are excessively tearing, guess what? Your body's trying to flush something out, you see? And tears have antimicrobial substances uh, and antiviral substances, and that's why the eye tears. And so if you take something to stop the tears, guess what? You're going to have a problem. Of course, if you get really watery eyes, and they're, and they're always watery, it might be because it's plugged. You know, and one of the drainage points is right here to the nose, and that you have tears running down your nose, which also helps in an antiviral, antibacterial sense in your nose, too. So it may be plugged, and that's why your eyes are watered up, because it's plugged. And the thing that usually plugs it up is dairy products. 
So, you know, stop doing the dairy, and then maybe you won't have a plug that's going to keep your eyes watering all the time. And if your eyes are dry, what do you think? Your tear ducts are probably plugged. Same thing, okay? And so um, we had one case that was really interesting. She'd gone, spent thousands and thousands of dollars on medical procedures, you know, because she had these dry eyes and all these teardrop things, you artificial tears and everything. Anyway, they'd, they'd even done surgery and they hadn't taken care of the problem. So she went to an associate of mine and uh, he goes, okay, let's see, um, I'm kind of running short here. You got to help me make dinner and then I'll work on you, you know. And so what he did was had her cut up onions for dinner. And he had her get really close to it and really cut those onions up. They cut up all more onions than ever used for a week of dinners, you know. And what happened was that she eventually started tearing. It actually brought it, unplugged the, the, the duct, and then she was able to flow freely. So for what, about 39 cents, she was able to get the problem solved. You know. That's what I'm saying, you know, it's no big complicated thing. It's not rocket science. We can take care of ourselves very easily. Um, let's see, where did I end up? Fevers. Okay. So as far as the fever is concerned, then what we do is we just put them in a big tub of hot water and uh, give them um, this particular herb here, yarrow, and you're going to find that out. I saw acres and acres of it up by Park City. I mean, this stuff's out there in the wild. Yarrow is a diaphoretic. That's what we use it for. Diaphoretic means it helps you perspire. Now diuretic means it helps you urinate. And it's interesting with, with uh, yarrow, if you drink it hot, it's a diaphoretic. If you drink it cold, it's a diuretic. So it works both ways. And if you drink it at body temperature, it tends to be kind of laxative for the bowels. Fantastic herb. Um, Yarrow, yarrow is used extensively as a dige for digestive disorders. So uh, here's one plant that you can take care of a lot of things that go around in the house just with this one plant. And it, it grows really nicely in your garden. So, you know, yarrow, and it's pretty, very pretty plant. So a lot of people grow it in their yards. And you make nice floral arrangements and stuff, you know. But the um, leaves of this particular plant, uh, it's called uh, Achillea millifolium because it looks like thousands of leaves. They're just little finely fern-like leaves. Um, the leaves are styptic, which means it stops bleeding. So uh, anytime you have a situation where you need to, the bleeding to stop, then that's what we do. And, ag and again, someone's bleeding. One of the purposes of bleeding is to get what you put in out. And so we let them bleed for a while to, to flush that out. And the body knows what it's doing, you know? You just got to help it. Uh, that's one of the other things uh, as far as bleeding is concerned. You know, everyone's concerned about clots these days. You know, oh, no, too many clots, too many clots. You know, the body doesn't clot unless there's damage. So you put a hole in your, your arterial system, your body will make a clot. So why would you want to take anti-clotting medication? You know, the uh, Russian czars are probably rolling in their graves, you know. Hemophilia was a problem with their children. They had to follow them around with pillows. And now we've got a drug that causes hemophilia. Keeps you from clotting. Same thing. But there's other things, you know, that will still work. And so we can look at the wasabi. Also, green tea is something that will help open up those lungs and, uh, and uh, get the blood going tightens up the vascular system and opens up the lungs and it works just kind of like that uh, epinephrine. Honey is a great one for allergies and also for asthma. And it's uh, because the bees go out and they gather all this pollen and all these things that you're supposedly allergic to, you know, and by giving little amounts, you can actually get over that situation. Talked about green tea, onions and garlic. Um, you know, we don't have any problem whatsoever with pneumonia. All you need is some onions. Have onions uh, growing in your yard. Because you can dig up those onions, cut them up, saute them with some olive oil, or put them in the oven and bake them. You don't want to brown it, but you just want to kind of um, clarify them. And then you take those clarified onions, put them right on the chest. Not too hot, of course, you know. Put them right on the chest. 
uh, put some cloth over that, um, some plastic, and you know, wrap some cloth around the torso to hold it on, and you put heating pads on there, and that takes care of pneumonia like you wouldn't believe. Just onions. See how cheap this medicine is? And so widely available. A garlic, you can just take the garlic, crush it into olive oil, extract the principles of the garlic out, take that garlic oil and rub it into the chest. That works fantastic also. So yeah, there's things you can do. And then a Mediterranean diet. You know, you've heard a lot about the Mediterranean diet being so good, and a lot of people go, oh yeah, I eat pizza, that's great. That's not the Mediterranean diet. Uh, those foods uh, are like festive foods, like we would have, you know, for parties. The Mediterranean diet is basically the same as the Okinawa diet, uh, as far, and as far as a natural foodist in the United States, it's all basically a lot of vegetables, whole grains, fruits, um, a lot of green leafy vegetables. That's a Mediterranean diet. You know, legumes. It's not these pastas and things. That's 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 festive food. Foods to avoid. Um, we clear up so many problems with congestion with dairy. Just get them off of dairy, they're fine. You know, and a lot of people go, well, if I don't do dairy, where am I going to get calcium? Where do cows get their calcium? You probably don't know this, but behind every barn, there's these big vats of milk, and the cows just go drink the milk. So you can't get calcium from anything but milk, right? I'm being facetious. You, know, you get it from the grass. You know, and calcium is a macronutrient in all the food you eat. So that's not a problem. Um, really highly processed grains can contribute to the asthma, to the allergies. Uh, we want to lower our salt and stay away from the standard American diet. Sad. It's really sad. Okay. There's nothing better for first aid than herb. I'm just saying one herb. If you know that one herb, there you go for first aid. Okay? So, the one herb and one procedure basically will take care of most first aid problems. With first aid, the first thing you want to check with, and you just have to remember the ABCs, is the airways have to be open and they need to breathe. And when you've got that taken care of, then you can stop any bleeding, any circulation problems. Okay. So, how do we take care of the first two? It's called the Heimlich Maneuver. All right. Has everybody done the Heimlich Maneuver? Okay. If you've got a partner, go ahead. Let's, let's just do it right now. Come on. Let's do the Heimlich. And if you're yourself, just go ahead and put your thumb right by your belly button, and then your hand over that, and then just go. <laughs> open your mouth and just see what happens. If anything's stuck there, that's how to get it out. So if there's obstruction, you do the Heimlich maneuver. If you're drowning, you know, mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation isn't going to do anything. You can't blow air into a balloon that's got water in it. If there's water in the lungs, you can't blow it up. You can, what happens is when you blow into the mouth with mouth-to-mouth with, uh, -mouth, mouth resuscitation, when they've got water in their lungs, it bypasses the lungs and goes right in the stomach and makes them throw up. That's the worst thing you can do, is give them mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. If there's something obstructing, you get it out. And you get it out by <gasps> doing the Heimlich. Okay. If you want to put pressure on the heart, the best place to put pressure on the heart is <laughs> here, <coughs> here. You can get more there than you can by pushing on the, the, the ribs. So you, if you know the Heimlich, you can save lives. That's what you need to know for first aid. So what we got here is we got this dog standing here, and we got this goat hitting the dog in the stomach, and we got this cat ejecting out of the dog's mouth. And it reads, fortunately for Sparky, Zeke knew the famous Rex maneuver. Well, we don't need to know the Rex maneuver, we just know the Heimlich maneuver, which is the same thing. And if there's any obstruction, you get the obstruction out with the Heimlich maneuver. Simple as that. Cayenne is 
the first aid herb, and it'll stop all these conditions. So if somebody's bleeding, you use cayenne. You know, sometimes you're just kind of in a hurry, you know, and uh, I was um, just needed a couple of slices off this apple, you know, so I just grabbed an apple and on the vegetable slicer, you know, took a couple of slices, and that second slice, it slipped, and my thumb went through the vegetable slicer. I took off so much of this pad, I mean, it was scary, you know? And it was bleeding, and uh, I mean, it was all over the place, and I'd packing it with cayenne. Um, besides packing it with cayenne, you got to get it down, but I was trying so hard to keep from getting blood all over my wife's kitchen that I, I you know, wasn't thinking about the, taking it orally. But as soon as I got the cayenne, was able to mix it in some water and drink it down, then the bleeding stopped. Uh, we had a, a student that uh, was listening to our lectures, and uh, without even using cayenne, he went ahead and uh, went out and gave a lecture on cayenne pepper. And uh, one of the guys in his uh, group was a Vietnam vet. And he just thought, wow, that is so fantastic, you know, you can use cayenne to stop bleeding, you know. So after the lecture, he just, he just still excited about it, he goes home and tells his dad, he says, you know what, if we had had cayenne in Nam, we could have saved so many lives because it stops bleeding. And dad goes, yeah, sure. And he goes, you don't think so? Pulls out his knife and cuts his arm and just starts bleeding profusely. He'd never used it before, and neither had his teacher used it before, so I hadn't really given full instructions on how to use it. So, um, so he takes some cayenne, he sprinkles it on it, and of course that didn't do any good because it just kept coming out. So he takes this cayenne pepper and he takes a handful and he puts it in there and grinds it in and holds it. And after a while, it stopped bleeding. And his dad goes, you could have done that with dirt. He said, you just clogged it up. He says, well, let's see. So he goes over to the sink, and he puts his arm under the sink, and he just starts scrubbing the cayenne out, you know. And it didn't start bleeding again. Cayenne stopped bleeding. My dad had a case where um, one of his students uh, was in her house, and she heard a gunshot from the neighbor's house. And she knew the parents weren't home, so she rushed over there, and the... Uh, a uh, four-year-old had shot the six-year-old with the pistol. Hit the spine, or the, the, the back tailbone there, not tailbone, the, the spine, yeah. Hit the spine, ricocheted out, so he's pumping blood out of two holes. Well, of course, the first thing you do is call 911. She did, she called 911. Took the ambulance a half hour to get there. He would have bled to death. She gave the kid a, a tablespoon of cayenne pepper, mixed it in the water, had him drink it down. By the time the ambulance had got there, the kid was uh, coherent, you know. They got him in the ambulance, took him to the hospital. Uh, while they're waiting for surgery, the kid's going, hey, I've never been in an ambulance before, you know. I mean, he's doing great. The bleeding wasn't pumping, you know. Um, the doctor, when he came out of surgery, he goes, you know, this is the first gunshot like this that I've seen that the cavity wasn't totally filled with blood. He says, uh, this is amazing. Well, cayenne's amazing. It helps the body stop bleeding. Um, shock. I don't know, I guess we all have kind of accidents and stuff, you know, but I was uh, cleaning the, the snow off my driveway. I had a little four-wheeler, you know, didn't really do a very good job. But, you know, I convinced my wife we needed it for cleaning the snow. Any rate, uh, it got stuck. I went to pull it out, and I went under it instead of it coming out. And I bumped my shin, and I thought, oh, that really hurts. But I went and finished, you know, cleaning the driveway and stuff. Went in the house, took my snow gear off. And I had the, the long white underwear on, you know. Uh, and it was white except for this quarter from my knee down. And it was totally red. I'm going, ooh, I think I've caused myself a problem. So I, I got the, the long johns off. <laughs> and uh, I didn't take anatomy in school, you know. I took it later off. But... Uh, I, I didn't get the chance to work on corpses and things, you know. So I saw this white thing, and I'm going, well, let's see. And I pulled it, and my toe moved. I'm going, oh, that is so cool. Look at that, you know. And I'm pulling this white thing, you know, and my toe's moving. I called my wife, and I said, look at this, you know. And I pulled it, and my toe moved. She goes, oh, that's really funny, <laughs> you know. And then I started going into shock, you know. And so she grabbed the cayenne and gave it to me and kept me from going into shock. Cayenne will stop you from going into shock, you know, and you don't want anyone going into shock, and so cayenne pepper is the perfect one for that. Um, 
Hypothermia. My daughter had the best case of that. Really interesting. She was with a choir tour, and they were in Oregon, and they'd gone to the beach. You know, the kids were used to maybe going to California where it's like nice and warm, you know, when you go to the beach. Oregon's not nice and warm. So they go to the beach in Oregon, and they're out in the water, and they all got cold, so they came in. One little girl was out there a little too long, and she came back, and she was going into hypothermia. Okay? Blue lips, you know, shivering. What's the worst thing you can do for someone that's going into hypothermia? Wrap a blanket around them. It's the refrigerator effect. Basically, you hold the cold, cold in. So you wrap a blanket around them, you're going to make it worse, the hypothermia. What do you need to do? You need to heat up the core. Okay, cayenne pepper is like swallowing a furnace. They measured in BTUs, you know, 40,000 BTUs. That's the, the mild ones. You've got like 120, 200,000 BTUs. It's like swallowing a furnace. You give them cayenne pepper, it heats the core, you're over the hypothermia almost immediately. Okay, so anyway, they didn't do that. They, 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 they were going to take this bus and rush it down these winding roads to try to get to town, you know, to, to do something for this hypothermia. You know, my, my daughter, she goes, well, I've got some cayenne, let's give her, no, don't you give her that cayenne, you know. And so here they were going to rush this bus. The little girl goes, let her give me anything she wants, you know. So she gave her the cayenne pepper. Almost immediately, those lips turned red, and her face turned red, and she was throwing the covers off, you know. It worked immediately. So the herb you need to know for first aid is cayenne pepper. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Okay, heart attack. My dad never lost one heart attack case when he gave him hot cayenne pepper. Because you take cayenne pepper, and it immediately gets in the bloodstream, boom, it's pumped to the heart, and that stops a heart attack. Okay. <clears throat> Self-reliant health. If you use these time-tested over thousands of years procedures, it's safe and it's effective. And it's inexpensive. It requires knowledge and common sense. And both are taught and acquired at the School of Natural Healing. We have a full Master Herbalist course, and this right here is level one of 22 levels. But if you take the first level of our school, you'll know more about natural healing than any doctor out there, okay? You can doctor your family with the family herbalist. That's why we call it the family herbalist course. That's level one of 22 levels. Now this course sells for $495. It's well worth it. We've got so many testimonials. People say, I've saved thousands of dollars on medical expenses because of this course. Guess what? We were able to get it on the internet electronically, and now you can take it for $295. Okay? At the show. Oops. At the show go get a card. You can either do it at the show here or you can do it uh, before Sunday night because it'll come off Sunday night. But you go on the internet, you sign up, you can get this $495 course for $100. Okay. Thank you for attending. Uh, a neighbor of ours went in for a routine checkup and the doctor started putting a catheter up her vein. She goes, doctor, that's invasive. Shouldn't you check with my family? He goes, oh, dearie, at your age, we need to check out the old ticker. She was on Coumadin. She died two, day, two, two days later from the damage caused from the catheter because she couldn't stop her own bleeding because you're on a drug that did that. You know? And then, and then oh, let's look at cholesterol. Do you know that that, that is the best-selling drug in the history of the world? 12.4 billion dollars a year they make on that drug. And does it do what it's supposed to do? Absolutely, that's why it's approved by the FDA. It lowers cholesterol. But you know there's not one study that shows that cholesterol has anything to do with heart disease. Isn't that why they take it? To save the heart? High cholesterol levels and all? Let me tell you another truth right here. Your body doesn't make any more of anything than it needs to. It's very conservative. 
It'll only make exactly what it needs of any substance. So, if you have high cholesterol levels and your liver's kicking out more cholesterol, what's the problem? They think the liver's the problem, so they give a drug that blocks the enzyme that makes cholesterol so you can't have any more cholesterol. And it lowers blood, it lowers blood cholesterol. What they don't remember is that the body is very conservative and will never make more of anything than it needs to make. So, if you've got high levels of cholesterol and your liver's kicking out cholesterol, we as vitalistic herbalists, we look at that and we go, well, the cholesterol must not be any good. The liver must check out that cholesterol and say, I can't use that. I can't use that. I can't use it. So, it'll make more cholesterol because it can't use what's already there. Why would it make more if there's already cholesterol? You see, your body's very conservative. It, it uses what it needs and doesn't make any more. And now, after they came out with that drug, now they found out that yes, there is two types of cholesterol. There's a hard, small cholesterol that cannot be used by your body. And what, what do we use cholesterol for? Anybody know? It repairs all damaged cells in the body. And you know, we're damaging cells all the time. The, the cells use cholesterol to repair themselves, uses cholesterol to make vitamin D. Isn't everybody vitamin D deficient now? Isn't that what they were telling us? Everyone's vitamin D deficient? You know why we're vitamin D deficient? Number one, we were told to stay out of the sun Num because the sun causes cancer. Oh, God really screwed up when he made the sun, didn't he? Yeah, here it is. It's going to warm you, but it's going to kill you if you get out in it. You can be out in the sun all day long. It's never going to cause cancer. But, in fact, it's really interesting. My dad had a case where this guy had uh, cancer in a place that never saw the sun. It was under his belt. And, um, anyway, he was a sheep herder, and my dad says, well, where do you herd your sheep? And he said, like, out in the middle of nowhere. And he goes, okay, this summer what you're going to do is you're going to herd that sheep, no clothes at all, because there's nobody out there. You know, and in your chuck wagon, you're only going to take grape juice. The whole summer he had nothing but grape juice. And he exposed himself to the sun all summer long. Well, that must have been quite the sight, you know. Here this sheep herders out there with cowboy hat, cowboy boots, and nothing else on. And he herded the sheep all summer that way, came back in the fall, and that cancer was gone. The sun actually heals cancer. It does not cause cancer. If you misuse the sun, if you're a a uh, weekend warrior and you're in an office all week, you know, and then in the weekend you go out and you lay on the beach all, all Saturday, you know, you're going you're gonna to burn and you're going to cause damage. Now, damage causes cancer, but the sun does not cause cancer. Let's get that one straight, okay? So they shouldn't have never said, you know, stay out of the sun, because basically what they did is they made the whole country vitamin D deficient. And also, by blocking the cholesterol, they, they did the same thing. So the no cholesterol, you can't make vitamin D and no sun, so you can't stimulate it to be made. So now no vitamin D. That's why everyone's vitamin D deficient. Because we thwarted what the body's supposed to do. So at any rate, now what they found out is that they've got this, this, this hard, unusable cholesterol. And when the liver makes cholesterol, it's soft and pliable. This is new, new science after they came up with the drug. So that's why the liver makes more cholesterol. So the body will have something usable. This other stuff's not usable. And how does it become unusable? Chemicals in your food, um, free radical oxygen. You know, your, your own cells make free radical oxygen. That's just part of the energy process. So anytime you expend energy, you're going to make free radical oxygen, whether you're burning wood or whether you're making uh, food on the, on the stove, whatever, you're always going to make free radical oxygen. The food that's the highest in free radical oxygen is charbroiled meat. That's where you're going to get the most free radical oxygen. And then your, your bakery items, uh, that's highly processed. And you're going to introduce more oxygen, free radical, into the system. So when you take that in, it, it basically attaches to uh, cholesterol. That's one of the first things it's attached to. And it becomes unusable, hard and unusable. OK, you understanding what's going on here? OK. The body will do everything it can to move towards wellness. All we have to do is help it. Okay. Uh, this yarrow is really interesting. You'll find out in the book there that it uh, uh, helps with um, bleeding in the lungs. It's one of the best things for that. Um, it'll actually bring on menstruation if a, a woman's not menstruating. And also, 
if she's discharging too much, it'll help uh, with excessive discharge. I mean, and we could go on and on and on about yarrow, but we don't have time for that. Here's one that uh, seems to plague people. <clears throat> Kids get earaches. That's going to happen, you know? And what's the standard way to deal with earaches? Give them an antibiotic. And guess what? They're going to have another earache in a few weeks. And then they're going to have another one. Then they're going to have another one. Then they're going to have another one. You can keep stopping it with antibiotics, but they're going to keep having in the earaches. Okay. Well, okay, what do you think's wrong? I don't know. I've had the same anatomy course as these doctors have, but I don't know why they have to drill a hole through the eardrum to get it to drain. They know as well as I do, they took their anatomy courses, there's a eustachian tube that any, any, any contaminants in the ear, inner ear, are going to come right out the eustachian tube into the back of the throat, and then you're going to get rid of them that way. That's how the body works. Did we forget about the eustachian tube? So, if we have a watery environment which is conducive then for bacteria or viruses, and we got that going on, why would we have that? Duh, it's not draining, is it? Eustachian tube's clogged up. And what do you think clogs up the eustachian tube more than anything? Dairy products. Okay. We get kids off of dairy, they stop having earaches. As night follows day. It's as simple as that. Now, well, now that they've got the earache, you know, a lot of times what will happen is uh, we herbalists will go ahead and put garlic oil in their ears. You just take garlic and mash it into olive oil, let it extract out there, and then put that oil in the ears, and that'll take care of an, an earache also. But they're going to have it come back if those eustachian tubes are clogged up. So, we as vitalistic herbalists, what we'll do is we'll do something to open up eustachian tubes. And one of the best things you can find in your garden if you're growing it would be horseradish. Take that horseradish and grate it up real fine, and then just put your nose right next to it, breathe deep, and a lot of times that will open up those eustachian tubes. Okay. Um, Another thing you can do is just uh, boil water on the stove, take it off, put your head over the steam, breathe the steam in, a lot of times that'll open up your station tube. I mean, we're talking free medicine here. And you can do it yourself. It's not rocket science. Something that everyone should be able to do is take care of themselves with what's available for free. You just go out there and pick it. This one's really interesting, you know. Um, I, guess, I guess now doctors are saying, okay, I think we did a little too much with some of these things and they're, they're starting to cut back on drugs. And we had someone come uh, to us that was um, having, their child was having colic, it was a baby, having colic. And uh, they went to the doctor and the doctor goes, oh, he'll get over it in a couple of months. If you ever had a screamy child with colic, you know, you don't want to wait a couple of months. So they asked us and we basically, we took these two herbs, fennel, which you're going to find here in the 100 herb syllabus, a uh, whole chapter on each of these herbs, uh, everything you could think of using uh, these herbs for. At any rate, fennel is something that uh, is carminative, which means you know, it's, it's, we use it for cooking, it flavors food and things. But anything that's carminative, anything that helps flavor our food, will help with digestive disorders. And so what we did was combined that with a nervine, catnips and nervine. You know, it, it may take cats and, you know, have them crawling on the ceiling, you know, and doing flip-flops, but with children and adults, what it does is it just calms things down. So by taking this calming herb, catnip, and combining it with this carminative fennel, we have the perfect solution for colic, and it works just like that. So your child has colic, and that day they won't have colic, because it works. In fact, we've even used it by just rubbing it on their stomach and it still worked. But taking it internally is the best way to do it. So, you know, very simple things you can take care of. But what's interesting is that herbs aren't just for simple things. They're for complicated things, too. You can take care of anything you need to take care of with what's provided out there in the wild. Speaking of out there in the wild, you know, the Food and Drug Administration made 
uh, Ma Wang or ephedra illegal. Okay, they had to go to Congress and everything, and they had to pass special legislation because they really couldn't prove that it really was a problem. If any of you know what happened with that one, basically, if you take ephedra, it has a certain stimulating effect to it. Um, Colonet has a certain stimulating effect to it. What they found is when they combined ephedra and colonut, then they got something 10 times more stimulating than um, either one separately. And you know how we are as Americans, we love our stimulants, you know. So anyway, this was 10 times more stimulating. Well, they went even a step further and they took and extracted, like you do with cocaine, they extracted the ephedrine out of the ephedra, and then they combined that ephedrine with caffeine from the colonut, you see. They put caffeine and ephedrine together. Now they have something 100 times more stimulating than the original plants, you see. Yeah, you can get more effect, but then you lose the safety, and that's when you start having people dying. And if you've read the accounts in the paper, no couch potatoes died from taking that substance. They were athletes, okay? Um, and basically just revved up their system, and then they were eating junk food, and they didn't have the nutrients they needed for that revved up system, and then they were pushing themselves, and then that's the ones that died. No couch potatoes died. And so here we have, it's the drug that really caused those deaths. Ephedra didn't. It's those drugs. And so what does the FDA do? They take the herb off the market that caused no deaths whatsoever, and you can still buy the drug without a prescription in any, any drugstore. Ephedrine, you know, in Sudafed, is still available, you know, but uh, not the herb. Well, we're blessed here in Utah because we've got this one here growing out in the desert. Not the desert desert, just, uh, you know, um, kind of sage and juniper areas. Um, ephedra in Utah doesn't have ephedrine, but it still works. So we get the same effect as the Ma Wong, the ephedra, without the ephedrine in it. If you look at a spectrographic analysis of Ma Wang, it just peaks really high at ephedrine and pseudoephedrine. Uh, this one doesn't. It peaks with something else and we have no idea what it is. But that's the thing with plants, is if it doesn't have in the soil what it needs to make one chemical, it'll make another one equally as good. And so we got it for free out there. And I'll tell you, there's nothing better than ephedra for asthma. They've been using it for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Basically what it does is it gets your circulatory system going and it opens up your lungs so you can breathe easier and get the blood out to the area that needs to be. Get the oxygen out to the cells. Fantastic plant and we got it for free. Just go out and pick it. If you don't know what it looks like, uh, I'd suggest taking a course in the School of Natural Healing. It will teach you these things and this book would be a great thing to have even if you don't take the course. Now the other one that we have here is um, marshmallow, and uh, marshmallow, um, we don't have, that, that's something that grows uh, in England and uh, is cultivated, but we've got something here that's just about as good, and it's called Malva Neglecta, and it's the uh, same family, it almost looks like it, but it doesn't grow upright, it grows along the ground. But that uh, marshmallow in our area, that Malva Neglecta, uh, is probably the very best anti-inflammatory that you'd ever get anywhere. And so um, since asthma is an autoimmune disease, meaning that your own immune system is attacking itself, um, we use the, the marshmallow in, a, in combination with astragalus. Astragalus is a specific uh, herb for the immune system that strengthens the immune system. But when we add marshmallow to the astragalus, then we get a calming effect on the immune system without compromising it. So we get a stronger immune system that's calmed down. That's what we want to do with asthma. We want to calm the asthma down, and then a uh, person's going to be able to breathe better. So a calming effect, uh, and then a strengthening effect. And so um, here's some plants that uh, will help you with even something serious like asthma. And then again, I, you know, remember I said uh, the body's not broken, it's just doing what it needs to do. Now what do you think is happening with 
autoimmune disease. Why would the body attack itself? Well, everything, everything your body does rejects protein, okay? You make your own protein, and so you can't put straight protein into your bloodstream. So what happens when you eat protein is your, your hydrochloric acid breaks it, splits it up into chains of amino acids, and then your pancreas puts out enzymes to break it down into individual amino acids, and then the body uptakes these particulates and puts them together as your protein. You can't take somebody else's protein and use it in your body. And so when you have allergies, it's generally due to proteins getting into your system. Whether you're breathing them, or whether you've got holes in your stomach called ulcers and it's getting into your bloodstream, or if you've got holes in your intestinal tract, which is called leaky gut syndrome, a result of antibiotics, and the, uh, the holes in your stomach are a result of painkillers. So if you get these holes in your system and you get proteins into your blood, then your immune system has to attack the proteins because they're foreign. Now what happens is if you get a protein that's really close to a protein your body makes, then the immune system sometimes is triggered against those cells that make that protein. Hence, they'll be triggered against the cells of the uh, lungs, or they'll be triggered against the uh, beta cells in the Isle of Langerhans in the pancreas, and you'll get juvenile onset diabetes, or you'll get multiple sclerosis, or when any of the autoimmune diseases are basically triggered by proteins getting into your bloodstream. Okay? So basically, again, the body's still doing what it needs to do. It just got off from putting something foreign in that shouldn't be there. So most of your allergies and things uh, can be relieved with the same thing using marshmallow and stragulus together. Okay? The um, foods that we want to be careful with with asthma, well, first of all, the ones we want to do. Vitamin C rich foods help tremendously. I'm not saying vitamin C, I'm saying vitamin C rich foods. Do you, do you, you know, we're looking at some statistics, and um, most of the people in the United States don't eat any vitamin C rich foods on a daily basis. In fact, most people don't eat any fruit on a daily basis. When they did the survey, they included Smucker's jams and fruit pies and uh, Pop-Tarts and everything else. Anything that had fruit in it was considered fruit. And 44% of the people in the United States didn't eat any fruit on a daily basis. And when they did do fruit, guess what it was? Guess what the number one fruit was that people ate? Frozen concentrated orange juice. See, that's the problem. We're not getting the vitamin C rich foods in our diet. So we'd want to do that. Um, citrus peels are something that you can use specifically for asthma. If you take a piece of an orange or a grapefruit or a lemon, and you take that and, and just take a piece of it and then bend it, you have these incredible oils coming off that citrus. And you can breathe that in, and that's one of the best things you can do for your lungs to protect them and to open them up. Just a peel just the peel. And also, if you're doing organic uh, produce, then you can take that citrus and you can take a carrot peeler and peel the colored part off, dry that, and have it from storage so that any time you have a cold or flu, that you've got that ready and you just heat some water, put it in it, and then drink that, and then you're going to get all that you need of those substances that are in that peel that you can press, okay? Um, and then the white part of the citrus, uh, which everybody throws away, is loaded with flavonoids, especially the flavonoid rutin, which uh, is necessary for the integrity of your vascular system. But I think a lot of people have vascular problems because they're not eating their vitamin C rich foods. You see? And you need that for asthma too. Uh, wasabi, you can get at any. Um, uh, Asian store or at, at restaurants, and that'll open those lungs right up. So if someone's having an asthma attack, and you're out, and there's an Asian restaurant, just go in and say, "Give me some wasabi," you know, 
and give it to them, and it'll open things up. They can, in fact, they can just breathe it. Breathe it up, and they'll open those lungs up and get them going again. Um, hot peppers get that circulation going so we can carry that oxygen to the cells. You know, it's interesting about that ephedra that we just talked about. There's only one, there is only one substance that I know of that uh, will act like epinephrine, you know? Instead of, if you don't have it, it's a lifesaver, you know, putting the epinephrine in. But there's something you can take orally that's the same as epinephrine, and that's ephedra. Now they've made it illegal. That's the only substitute I know of that can do that same.